This video is not a novel idea. Almost every YouTuber under the sun has some sort of video detailing their favourite games from a given year, or that they played in a particular year regardless of the release date. This video is the latter. I'm recording this video like this by the way because my Christmas tree is still up and this isn't really a Christmassy video. Um, and I'm, I, The only reason it's still up is because I'm recording this during Christmas because obviously you have to record it before the video is made. So regardless, it's like this. This is what we're doing. We've got Jungle Skog here though, so... He's happy to be here, though. I play a lot of games every single year, and only some of those end up becoming major videos, because I have to prioritise, because I have to make the things that I want to make the most. And that sucks a little bit. There are so many games that I play each year that deeply resonate with me, that came out at just the right time in my life, or that were the perfect break. And so I wanted to jump on this very common trend and make a collection of very small video essays for all the games that were special to me this year, that made my 2023. And maybe we can make this a yearly tradition so that every year I can look back at the games I played over the past 12 months and maybe give you something new to add to your backlog, ensuring that you never finish it. December last year, I bought myself a Steam Deck, not because I'm often traveling and in need of playing games, but because I just really wanted to be able to play games in bed with my son. <laughs> it does sound a little bit stupid, but god is it relaxing. I've had a Switch for years, but the Steam Deck is just so much more versatile, powerful, and geared towards the type of gaming that I find myself doing more often. The first game that I found myself playing with the deck is a game I've had sitting in my Steam wishlist for years. Code Vein. <laughs> Code Vein is, to put it in the most basic terms, an anime Souls-like, which is two kinds of acquired taste, but for me, they gel easily together. I'm not sure what it is that drew me to this game, but I think part of it was the fact I started streaming Bloodborne in December of 2022, and I wanted more of a hit of that Souls drug without tearing away from my streaming content, and so I made a compromise. One of the biggest things I loved was the character creator, which is incredibly detailed, from your basic body and face adjustments to being able to change where particular accessories are on your arms and legs. You can really just create whatever sort of anime gamer you want to take on the challenges that lay ahead. Thinking back to January, I can't tell you much of what the game was about narratively, but then I don't think I could do that for Bloodborne either, which isn't to say the story is comparable to Bloodborne, just that I don't think it really matters. The gameplay loop is where the game excels. In typical Souls fashion, you fight enemies, explore and map out a level, discover secrets, gain better gear and loot, and then use it all to fight a tough-as-nails boss at the end. And while not unique, I did find Code Vein to take the tried and tested Souls formula and execute it in an interestingly new way. Although, at times, especially this one level, it looks like they just fully ripped off Dark Souls, and the level design was absolutely insane. I had no idea where I was going. It took me maybe five hours. I hated every goddamn second of this level. It does, however, add its own flair to combat by having you constantly with a companion of your choice from the main cast of characters, and each can provide a different kind of help depending on your playstyle. God, I wish I could remember the context of this scene. <laughs> and the characters each provide some levity throughout the story, which was often nice. You also have different abilities you can equip, which do different shit, like teleporting to an enemy for a strike or letting out a flurry of slashes. It's a nice system to play around with. I found myself following up on tons of little side quests, trying to make sure I'd visited every corner of a map before moving on, and even working to max out some of my gear, which really are not things I usually do in games. I tend to beeline the main story, unless it's particularly engaging, which I, I guess this game was. I think it's doubly funny though, because I, I've never played Dark Souls, but I have played a few Souls-like games in my time, so when it eventually comes time to play the Dark Souls trilogy, maybe I'll have a totally newfound appreciation for them, having so much knowledge of what they inspired. And talking about inspiration, the next game I dived into was Dripping in it, a game I've been looking forward to for a while but hadn't even noticed had been out for almost a year at that point. Tunic. Tunic is very obviously inspired by a few things, most notably the classic Legend of Zelda titles, and again, Dark Souls. You wouldn't think it by looking at it, but it does follow that Souls-like model. You fight enemies, you upgrade yourself, you slowly map out an interconnected world with shortcuts and harder enemies and boss fights with lore and a story you have to piece together yourself. But that's the crux of Tunic for me. 
the mystery of it all. Sure, the gameplay is fun and engaging and the level design is incredibly meticulous, but it's the moments outside of that that struck a chord with me. Just standing still and taking it all in. The music, the atmosphere, and the unfamiliar familiarity of it all. The game has a kind of unsettling comfort that's hard to describe, from the way it tells you nothing, even item descriptions and nonsense, to the collectibles being pages from a guidebook on a game that you are currently playing that also isn't written in a real language. The game never treats you like an idiot. In fact, it assumes you're intelligent enough to piece it all together mechanically and narratively without ever telling you a single thing. But to have that confidence in the player, you have to have the same level of confidence in your own creation, and Tunic is built almost perfectly to back up the ability to allow the player to figure it out themselves with no instruction. I've actually started and stopped writing multiple scripts with this game at the centre because I cannot find the words to properly explain what Tunic made me feel, both during play and in the moments between playing. I believe Rasputin conveyed this feeling best when he said in his rundown of games that he played in 2022, It's a rare title where ruminating on it between play sessions is part of the process. And that is completely spot on to my experience with this game. When I wasn't playing it, I was thinking about it, and when I was playing it, I was completely locked in. I do not want to spoil this game, because the sense of discovery as you start to piece things together yourself is deeply rewarding, and it genuinely moved me. There's not many games that can convince me to go out of my way to discover every secret and unlock the best possible ending when I, I could instead usually just pull it up on YouTube, but Tunic earned that from me. I feel a deep respect for this game in a way that a lot of games simply don't make me feel. After these two games that both took inspiration from the Souls formula in different ways, I wanted to look towards something different, and despite these next two games seeming very different from each other, I assure you they're linked, and I played them both at the same time. House Flipper and Nino Kuni 2. I'm aware they sound like games at polar opposites of the video game spectrum, but they both satisfied a particular urge that I had around March 2023 which was building. Not as intricate as Minecraft or as large scale as City Skylines, but something all-encompassing while being a tad more personal. I've always loved small town building mechanics or home renovation, like Monteregioni in Assassin's Creed 2 or Corvo Bianco in The Witcher 3 Blood and Wine, and so House Flipper and Nino Kuni 2 both provided that for me in different ways, and I would switch between both of them frequently depending on what I was feeling more. To talk about the former first, House Flipper is a sim game where you basically buy properties in disrepair and then renovate them to make a profit, which allows you to appreciate how fun it would be were it possible to succeed at capitalism. You start off doing odd jobs for people until you can buy your first property, and then it's really off to the races. The progression of tools and unlocks is steady, and you always feel like there's more to do and infinite possibilities. I really found comfort and a sense of relaxation in this game, and it's one that I still go back to now, even though the sequel is out, mainly because House Flipper 2 is a nightmare on the Steam Deck, and I want to play this from my bed, so I guess I'll stick to the original for now, I guess. How does Nino Kuni have anything to do with this? I'm so glad you asked. Nino Kuni 2 is not connected to the first game in the series, so I didn't have to worry about not understanding anything because similar to Final Fantasy, each game is its own thing. The basis is that it's a classic JRPG, a la Dragon Quest and the aforementioned Final Fantasy, and in a time when I've played through Final Fantasy 1 through 9 and found 10 to be lacking on a lot of the core aspects that I loved, and despite enjoying 16, it also lacked those traditional Final Fantasy elements that I adore so much, Nino Kuni 2 provided an experience that felt like something from the SNES era of Final Fantasy, but with a modern twist. It proves that Final Fantasy didn't need to go down the route it ultimately did, and could very easily make an experience similar to that of the NES to PS1 eras. You have an overworld, tons of quests, vehicles that allow for different methods of exploration across the map, various story arcs, a party that is yours to control and gear up, as well as some very interesting unique mechanics. One of which is the conquest mode that allows you to go to battle with different military units to fight for dominance over particular areas of the world. But the other one that ties this back around is the Kingdom Builder. A core cool part of Nino Kuni 2's story is building a team around King Evan and starting your own kingdom to unite the world, and core to this journey is the ability to build your own kingdom piece by piece and settler by settler. I thought this was 
utterly tremendous. You start out with a small collection of huts and tents with a few people, and by the end you have a huge kingdom of shops and buildings and a castle. You can upgrade every building, and each building earns money and resources so you can build the next thing or get powerful gear upgrades. The people of the town are recruited by visiting major cities in the story and completing their side quests to have them move in. The more experts you have in particular fields, the more efficiently particular shops or buildings run, and the more money and items you receive. It's the driving force of everything you do, and despite the story being relatively basic, albeit charming, it was the kingdom building mechanic that pushed me on and gave me the motivation to see it all through. This game was one of my favourites I played this year, and it's well worth a shot if you're into JRPGs, or even if you're not, maybe this will be your gateway into hell. You're welcome, and make sure to have a therapist on standby. This is a special one. It's What's written by point? one of the greatest video game composers of all time, the legendary Nobuo Utamatsu. Here is the Game Awards Orchestra led by Lord My heart almost Lee stopped. From Switching gears, I played my first ever roguelike this year, a game I didn't ever really intend to play because I didn't think it was me, but I was in the mood for trying things outside of my usual box of games I decided are typically my thing. And so I started up Hades. I think you can tell by this point that most of the games I played in the first half of the year were all games that played incredibly well on the Steam Deck, because a lot of gaming I did for things that were outside of video content was stuff that I could just play when relaxing for a few hours in the evening before sleeping for the night. It was a really nice routine, and Hades was a highlight of my year. I'd never played a game like this before, and so really had no idea what to expect, but blimey. This was a treat. I love the character, the charm, every single character in this game had so much depth and charisma. It was such a cleverly written game, both in how the characters were presented, but also how the story slowly unfolded. A core part of a roguelike is losing. If you never lost, you'd actually experience far less of the game, and this was something I learned pretty fast. Every time you die, you'll reset to square one, and when it happens, you get another ton of new dialogue from all of the main cast. Whereas in most games, death is an annoyance, in Hades, it never felt that way. I never felt angry or frustrated when I lost. It was all part of the process. I was collecting important data for my next run. The win was a slow burn, and I loved that. Learning which boons were the best combo for my playstyle, testing out the different weapons, knowing where to take risks and where to play it safe. Finally getting to the end and beating that final boss was a goddamn joy. And then to find out that what I thought was the end wasn't at all the end was such a twist. To realise I had to beat the game again and again and again before I could truly beat it was a gut punch, but when I took in stride. Hades is marvellous, and I'm sure you don't need me to tell you that. There's a reason it won so many awards. The game is just a blast to play while being visually stunning and narratively enthralling. Hades is one of the best video games I've probably ever played, and I'm so glad I decided on a whim to actually give it a go. I too often find myself looking at games and saying, ah, it's just not for me. And I have to learn to stop doing that. I did it in 2015 with Kingdom Hearts, but eventually caved and realised I was completely wrong. It absolutely is for me. And I did it again this year with Hades. Sometimes you have to just play it anyway. Maybe it won't be for you, but you could be completely wrong and discover one of your favourite games. Another just like that for me is actually Bloodborne. For so long, I felt that Soulsborne games just weren't for me. Not necessarily because of the formula, because like I said, I've played tons of Souls-likes and I generally enjoy them. Dark Souls though, I don't know, something about the oppressive tone, the obscured story, the depressing atmosphere, I just could never bring myself to give them a fair crack. Even after finishing the Demon Souls remake and really enjoying my time with it, I didn't have that desire to go back and ever do it again. But after starting Bloodborne in December of 2022, it quickly became a go-to game to stream on Twitch whenever I was feeling a stream but didn't know what to play. Bloodborne is the first time I really got it. Demon's Souls was fun, but I never truly got it. But with Bloodborne, I absolutely did. Since playing it, I've checked out HBomberGuy's video on the game, and it hit me just why this is the one that did it for me. It's something I noticed myself while playing as well. That omission of the shield forces you to understand how the Souls games are supposed to be enjoyed, and when you get it, like when you fundamentally get it, it's one of the most rewarding things you can play. Not just that, but the tone, the atmosphere, the level design, both mechanically and visually, the soundtrack. Bloodborne is a masterpiece. The game is just consistently brilliant in every single avenue, and despite not having finished it yet, I'm slowly making my way through, 
it's convinced me I need to just play the Dark Souls trilogy. I have to at some point, off stream, on my own, just play Dark Souls 1 to 3 and soak it all in, understand it all, and just enjoy it. Who knows? Maybe it'll even spark the inspiration for a video. Although, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to outdo this one. <laughs> Holy shit. Around this time is when I stopped playing games for a decent bit, or at least stopped playing them in my free time. I found myself playing a lot more stuff for videos, with Assassin's Creed 1, Burning Shores, Jedi Survivor, and Final Fantasy 16, which I'm still yet to upload all of my reactions of to its last boy, and look, I promise I'll do it soon. I also visited Italy too for just under two weeks with my girlfriend, which was a fucking blast. And we vlogged the whole thing as well, so if you want to watch us potter around Florence and make an obscene amount of Assassin's Creed references, feel free, the link's in the description. I really love that video. I also found myself watching a lot more films as well, and, and games kind of took a backseat to that and content creation in general. I think this was a point for me where I was really reconsidering how I view games and art in general. I spent a lot of time watching new creators and video essays that I discovered. I got into Jacob Geller's stuff, one of the best to ever do it. Cursed Judge was another I really began to enjoy, as well as Ludacere and Andrew Blewett's retrospectives on Final Fantasy. Pixel A Day is also a channel I quickly began to adore. You need to check out her most recent video, it's fantastic. My perspective really shifted this year, around April to October-ish, and so in terms of new games that I played, it was pretty quiet. But I did take some time to reflect on a game that I played towards the start of the year, one that I subsequently edited into some videos for my second channel, It's Lazboy, a game that really, really unexpectedly left its mark on me. Final Fantasy IX. Since 2021, I've been playing through the Final Fantasy games in order, from Final Fantasy 1 through to the present day, and documenting it through streams which are on my VODs channel and edited videos which are on It's Lazboy. I've really loved the journey and have felt myself understanding games through a different lens by playing these and observing the design philosophy evolve. And while I hold dear the likes of Final Fantasy 4, 6, and 7, of course, I didn't expect any to hit me quite the way that Final Fantasy IX did. I plan one day to create a larger video for Final Fantasy IX because I just love it that much. It captures all of the elements I adored about that NES to PS1 era of games and rolls it up into the most delightful and enthralling JRPG I think I've ever played. From the setting and world and how every locale informs the themes the game wants to explore, to the entire party and how every single character could in so many ways be considered a protagonist in their own role the beautiful soundtrack, the charming animation work, the in-depth combat and progression, and the heaps and heaps of nods to the eight games that preceded it. Final Fantasy IX, to me, is the Final Fantasy game. I laughed, I cried, I got mad, I felt incredible joy. This game is beautiful, and if you only ever play one Final Fantasy game in your life, make it Final Fantasy IX. And if you only play two, make sure Final Fantasy IX is also one of them as well. There is plenty more I could say, but since I'm planning one day to make a big video on this one, I'll leave it here for now. Picking back up after my hiatus of not playing games for fun so I could work myself to death, Bethesda released their first new IP in 25 years, and being a huge fan of Fallout and Elder Scrolls, I was deeply looking forward to trying out Starfield. I know a lot of people found this game to be disappointing, and I'm not here to ignore the shortcomings or criticisms. Nakey Jakey's made a great video on that, and I feel he nails home the issues with Bethesda and the way they design games, and how that has led to Starfield feeling deeply flawed in a lot of places. That said, I had so much fun with this game. I never finished the main story, I only ever played around 55 hours, but for those 55 hours, most of which was over the course of 4 or 5 days, I just had endless fun. It felt like I was 14 again, booting up Skyrim, just seeing where it would all take me, what adventures I would have and what stories I could create for myself. I spent 6 hours one day doing nothing but mapping out a planet and building my own little base. It's shit like this that captivated me. And sure, there are issues, sure the writing lacks in places like Bethesda games often do, the game does sometimes feel like busy work and a fuck ton of fast travel and load screens, but somehow beneath all of that, beneath the jank and the bullshit, was a game that... I just had fun with. 
I don't know when I'll go back, and honestly, I don't really feel like it right now. I'm mainly waiting for the guys who made the TARDIS mod for Skyrim and Fallout to make one for Starfield, because once that shit happens, you best believe I'm hopping back in. It's the perfect game for it, especially with all the fast travel and loading. You can just circumvent that with a TARDIS because it's literally a fast travel box. Regardless, though, despite its issues, of which there are plenty, Starfield was a fun week for me that I deeply needed after months of maybe working a bit too hard. And talking of games that I deeply needed, without realising I needed them, was Mario Wonder. Mario is a franchise I've never had a particularly close relationship with. I did love those original games, I used to play them with my mate who had all the Nintendo consoles when we were kids, but I always had Sega, so I was a Sonic guy, unfortunately for me in 2023. I picked the wrong nostalgia when I was a baby, but I have always appreciated how good Mario usually is. From the classics to 64 to Sunshine to Galaxy to Odyssey, Mario has always done new things while retaining a deep sense of quality. Wonder is absolutely no exception. This game came at just the right time. I needed something simple yet rewarding, and Mario Wonder was there brimming with the most refreshing energy. I played the game co-op with my girlfriend, she really looks like that by the way, and it felt so good to sit down and play some couch co-op. My brother and I always used to play games like this back in the day when we were kids, and it was such a nice throwback to do it again, but with my girlfriend in our own living room, in our own house. I felt like a kid again. We had plenty of arguments, we laughed, celebrated, and had hours of fun with a game that that isn't revolutionary, but is damn good at capturing what made Mario such a staple. The controls are tight, it's dripping with style, and the variety of locations and missions keep things endlessly fresh. It's not a long game, but it's a quality one, and that for me will always be the most important thing. Mario Wonder really is tremendous. The game that would have been my game of the year until I played something else was Dontnod's newest release. Jassant. Jassant is a game about climbing a big rock. You have to get to the top while solving environmental puzzles and learning about the lost civilization that lays before you within the giant rock. The difference with this game though is how the climbing functions mechanically. You have to physically reach for each handhold with the analog stick and use the triggers of your controller to grab it and then hold on tight as you reach for the next handhold, or while monitoring your stamina. The vulnerability of this gameplay is paired with the vulnerability of the theming. How the gameplay and story play into one another is touching and moving and special as well as being incredibly fun to actually play. The puzzles and climbing get harder and harder the higher you get, and you start having to look at the world you're moving through totally differently to succeed. It never gets too hard, it always remains beatable so you aren't falling down to the bottom every time you make a little mistake, but it's just challenging enough that if you can't adapt on the fly, then you might struggle a little bit. As you become more familiar with the game, you'll become more efficient at climbing, and suddenly, a system that felt so foreign and slow and strange becomes efficient and fast, and it's a testament to how intuitive the climbing system really is. The true strength of this game, though, lies in what it's trying to say. I won't spoil it, because I think discovering the story and uncovering what this game is really saying is part of the experience, and I, I want you to play this game. It's only three hours or so, it's on Game Pass, it's deeply worth it. There's a message of fragility, of human perseverance, of looking at the downfall of society, and instead of making it nihilistic, making it hopeful. In a time when things feel like they're falling down around us, like we as people are a deep problem, Jassant looks at humanity in a positive way. It asks you to stand, and to watch, and to wait, and to absorb the life we all live to hang onto the precious moments, and to experience the here and now, instead of gazing forever onward to a future you won't ever truly exist in unless you stop, and you look, and you listen. Life is what's happening before you, not the major events you're counting down the days to, but the little things like a coffee in the morning, opening the back door for your dog to take a leak, sitting down and writing the words of a YouTube video script. Jasant is exceptional at making you think of the second you're experiencing right now, and it conveys it through the core narrative and through its simple and rewarding gameplay loop. Even its collectibles, little shells which contain memories from the past, the game asks you to sit and to listen to it, to these windows into time, long forgotten, and to absorb it because as soon as you back out of the interaction, it fizzles away, and it can't be retrieved. So appreciate where you are, right, right now, this second, right now, what you have, who you are, and less about where you're going next, because 
before you know it, you'll be in the next second, and the next second, and the next second, and the now will be gone. That's really the meaning of Jasant. I said Jasanth would have been my game of the year, were it not for something else. That of course being the masterpiece of a game, Alan Wake 2. Now I didn't just play Alan Wake 2 this year, I also for the first time played Alan Wake and Control as well. I wanted, not necessarily to have context for the newest game, but I wanted to observe how Remedy built upon a philosophy of design and presentation that is carried across all three of the games, and I'm so glad I decided to do this. On a lore level, the consistency and delicacy with how the fictional rules are built and established are just riveting. Alan Wake 1 establishes a story, characters, a world, and then Control seeks to explain it, while retaining ample mystery. It doesn't give you all of the answers because that would be missing the point. But it does give context and some form of explanation to what's going on in Alan Wake. And that information, going into Alan Wake 2, transforms what you thought you knew about Bright Falls and The Dark Place. I obviously don't want to spoil any of this, so I'll leave that there. I do plan to release a companion piece to this video on Patreon, a full spoiler-filled commentary of my thoughts and analysis off the cuff for all three of these games. So if you want to support me and you want to hear my full detailed thoughts on Alan Wake, Control and Alan Wake 2, Patreon is the place for that. I think what hit me so strongly about these games is that while being supernatural, while having a ton of rules and lore and secrets and very specific details you can uncover, the core focus is always themes and concepts. Alan Wake and Alan Wake 2 don't get bogged down in the semantics or the lore of it all. It's not trying to be a connected universe that thrives on references and callbacks. Those things exist, but they're just a byproduct of what is. The core focus and the point is to tell a story that has meaning. The exploration of a tortured artist through literal means that manifest through the game's lore. The rules are always consistent and compelling and lack contrivance, but they aren't the focus. They're just a tool to convey a narrative that wants to explore characters in a way that resonates, and to me, it resonated most deeply. After I finished my video on Spider-Man 1 earlier this year, I hit a wall with writing and content creation. I just couldn't find the motivation for the first time in years to start a new project. I had no idea what to make. I just stopped. I wasn't streaming, I wasn't writing, I wasn't editing. I just took some time out for like a month and a half. I just hit a wall. It was the strangest feeling because I've never had that happen to me before. I was worried I'd lost my love for this whole thing, that I was ready to maybe move on and do something else. I know that sounds dramatic, but in that state of mind, I really genuinely couldn't ever fathom writing anything ever again. Nothing piqued my interest, nothing felt right. Then I played Alan Wake a game about a writer who has writer's block, whose story he cannot remember creating comes to life to haunt him, a story he has to fight against to fix, to use creativity to win, a game about a dark place that uses art to consume artists and twist their vision into something ghastly. Alan Wake sparked my motivation again. It made me want to write to create. It reminded me of the power and importance of creativity and art, and not to get lost in yourself. Nothing though could have prepared me for that sequel. Alan Wake 2 is a masterpiece. I've said it multiple times, but it's true. The game takes the themes and ideas of the first game and the rules of control and concepts explored and raises it tenfold. Alan Wake 2 is a story about an artist who has lost himself to the art he creates, a character within his own text losing autonomy, fighting against himself and his own dark presence to reclaim the purity of his own creativity. I can't go much deeper without spoiling a story that I think is one of the best the art form has ever told, not just because of its message and ideas, but in its presentation of those ideas. Alan Wake 2 takes some of the interesting concepts concepts from the first game and control and ramps it up. The use of live action sequences to convey different parts of the narrative to create an uneasy juxtaposition between chapters, using music and episodic formatting to convey meaning and create tension. 
everything in Alan Wake 2 is done for a reason and a deep reason at that. It's one of the video games of all time. I'm talking about games like God of War 2018, Red Dead Redemption 2, The Last of Us Part 2, games that rock the boat, that stick with you for better or worse, that create lasting impact, not just through their story, but through their presentation of that story and by telling it in a way that only video games truly can. And all of that is, without saying, it's probably my favourite survival horror game, like ever. Sure, I'm not a veteran in the genre, I think my Resident Evil video just about gets that across, but Alan Wake 2 is probably the game I wanted Resident Evil 4 to be. A game that is terrifying, but with a tantalising story that makes it all worth it. I was mesmerised playing Alan Wake 2, I was scared shitless playing Alan Wake 2, but I kept pushing on because I had to know what happened next, where we'd end up, what the game would do with its messaging by the end. I did every side mission I could, collected every item, completed every case because I had to make sure there was no piece of this puzzle that I was missing, nothing I didn't know because the story is so wonderful I needed to explore all of it. And it doesn't hurt that the rewards make your journey through the game that little bit easier. Alan Wake 2 isn't just my game of the year, it's one of the best games I've ever played that speaks to the value in video games as an art form, not just for telling stories but for creating an all-encompassing experience with depth and meaning. It's one of the most mind-bendingly, horrifically beautiful games I have ever played, and it's so worth picking up. Plus, the first one in Control also slap pretty hard. Did you know Control was basically a Souls-like? I had, I had no idea until I played it, but damn, it's fun. One day I'll actually play Dark Souls. <laughs> and that's my year. The games that mattered to me, that did something for me, that were special in 2023. I felt more in touch with games this year than I have in a while, and I think part of that comes from the projects that I decided to focus on, the games that I decided to play that usually maybe I wouldn't and the way that my perspective on art significantly shifted over the course of the year and I'm really looking forward to next year and trying out a bunch of different games both new and old typical and atypical and I want to know your thoughts on this year what are your favorite games that you played in 2023 not ones necessarily that came out this year but that left their mark on you this year that made your 2023 a little bit more special. I'd be interested to hear and maybe add some of them to my backlog too, so that I also never finish it. <laughs> also, I will play Baldur's Gate 3. It hurts me too that I missed that one. I really, really want to play it, but sometimes I just don't have time for big games like that. Once I have a little bit of time in between some major projects, just like a month maybe, to just marinate in my own juices and play something like Baldur's Gate to really commit, then I'll give it a go. And I'll let you know what I thought. Maybe. Uh... I don't tweet much, so I guess the podcast, or Patreon, or you can just ask me on a stream, come on, come, to, come to a stream and say, what did you think of Baldur's Gate 3, have you played it yet? Um, and I guess, you know, I can tell you then, so. 2023 for me has been interesting in a bunch of ways. I have a post that I put out on Patreon for all members, even if you're a free member, which you can be now, going over my channel this year, all of my uploads, and what I think about them in retrospect. It was a fun little thing to write up, so give it a look if you're interested. For paying members though, if you're part of the Blazers Vault tier where you get all of the bonus and early access content, I do talk about this more in depth, introspectively as well, on the 11th episode of the Jazz Lounge podcast. I go into my uploads, my life, things that have changed for me this year, and how I'm generally feeling. So if you're interested, then that's there for you, as well as tons of other stuff on Patreon. Um, I'm always doing bits and bobs over there. It's really worth it if you want to support me if you don't want to support me it's absolutely not worth it at all because that because that's sort of the point isn't it but one of the major aspects of my 2023 and making it was these games that i played in this video video games will forever be special to me and i'm happy to have experienced so many special ones this year and i hope that next year i can do the same That's a wrap, folks, on 2023. Holy shit, what a year. What a weird, different, and interesting year. For me, anyway. I don't know. Maybe for you, it was just the same old sort of shit. Um, which, that kind of sucks. I hope that next year you have a more interesting one. Um, because, you know, that can happen sometimes. I feel like I've had a lot of pretty, pretty <laughs> rubbish years <laughs> for a while. <laughs> Thank you so much, though, for the support this year. If you do want to read up on my thoughts on the channel this year and uploads and sort of retrospectively look at what I've done, then that is there on Patreon, as well as 
what I talk about in Jazz Lounge as well. Um, big thank you to everyone on Patreon. A huge, huge thank you. I, I really couldn't do what I do without you. I couldn't improve the way that I do. I couldn't spend as much time as I do on stuff. Um, and I, I just really, I really deeply appreciate the support that I get over there. You, you really do work to, to help me to be able to just to make more and to spend my time working on something and making it really special and i hope that that's then worth it for you and thank you as well of course as always to my patreon producers which uh i'll let my future self um read out thank you to nathan l garcia luke pierce ethan rollins callum thethmus kelly arenathon flash paradox conocido sam cabbage and damian the not so orange gnome I bloody love you. And that's really it for this year. Um, I do have a couple more Patreon posts that I think will be happening, Clubhouse and my review of the Dog 2 Christmas special when that happens. Um, although that's probably already, they're both, maybe they're both already out by the time this video is out. Maybe, there's tons of stuff always happening on Patreon. I'm always posting stuff over there. It's, honestly, it's great, I love it. But 2024 will hopefully be a pretty positive and interesting year, at least in terms of YouTube content creation. I can't really speak for the wider world because usually everything's sort of imploding all up at once and it sucks it really yeah sorry i didn't mean to didn't mean to put a downer on this <laughs> but i have a lot of plans for stuff i want to make next year a lot of creative things that i'm interested in doing i talk a little bit more about that on jazz lounge but the first one coming next year is my retrospective on black flag it's gonna be an interesting one it really is i've got a lot of plans and i think it's gonna be quite different to the other assassin's creed ones that i've done uh, over the last few years um i know the ac1 one was also different from what i made in terms of the Ezio stuff but i think this will be even different again um in terms of the way i want to sort of like structure it and the things i want to talk about and the way that i take it i think it'll be a lot less straightforward but i'm really looking forward to getting stuck in and, and, and making that one um i think it's gonna be gonna be great it'll it'll come by the end of february look just stop stop asking about it it's coming it's coming um but <sighs> nobody's gonna watch all the way to the end of this so it doesn't even matter you won't even you won't even know you'll keep asking me anyway but that's it for me i uh i won't keep you um hope you all have a good new year and um i really i really appreciate all the support i really really do looking forward to next year thank you all so much and I'll, uh, I'll see you later. Bye-bye.